Hey, you're awesome. You guys really came through in the last video with so much genuinely thoughtful feedback. So this devlog is a story of how you improved the canoeing in Farewell North. So for as long as I've been showing canoeing in the game, a lot of you have been offering feedback on the animations. There have been hundreds of comments about the animations, a lot of them encouraging and helpful, and yeah, a few that cut a bit deeper. That's okay though. I completely agree. But the thing is, I'm just not a good animator. It's a real skill that people dedicate their professional lives to, and if you've been following my channel, well, you know. Uh, so anyways, the paddling animations specifically are the most complex in the game. There's only actually three unique animations, but there are so many variations of blends so that it always feels responsive to your input, but still looks reasonable in the animation so the paddle doesn't go through the canoe or the dog. To make matters worse, for the longest time there's been this really weird bug where her butt just wiggles back and forth, and I have absolutely no idea where this motion comes from. It's not in the blender animation, but for some reason Unity demands that her butt starts sliding around. You might think that some hip motion is actually necessary here, but the problem is I have no control over it, so it just looks kind of silly. I've tried everything I can think of, and nothing has worked. It's driven me absolutely crazy for about six months now, and I honestly thought I'd never solve it, until somehow I did. I have no idea how, but it stopped. Now, this obviously doesn't fix the animation, but for me this was a huge confidence boost, and with that, I headed back into Blender. And it is finally... well, it's not perfect, but it's passable. This isn't the last time I'll do this animation. It's still a bit stiff, her shoulders and head can definitely be improved, and I do need to bring back a little bit of controlled hip movement, but I think the animation feels a lot better now. Maybe the most common suggestion in the last video was to make the color form in the wake of the canoe rather than in a sphere around you, and you know what? I absolutely love this idea. I admit the sphere is pretty unnatural, so every time you guys gave this comment, I kept thinking over and over how I could actually do it. I had just about written it off as being impossible. You see, the colouring has to work on both the CPU, for interacting with the world and triggering audio changes and all that kind of stuff, as well as on the GPU for the actual visuals. Sometimes other developers suggest using shader-specific tricks, like the stencil buffer for colouring, but without getting too detailed in it, it just won't work for Farewell North. The visuals and the interactions need to be perfectly in sync, and that can't be done with shader tricks, so all the colouring in Farewell North works in the shape of spheres, because they're very simple to express, they're just four numbers. So they're easy to keep in sync between the CPU and the GPU. They do have a few additional properties like intensity, health, whether you can see through them or not, but that's about it. I recently added noise to the spheres so they can have a bit more texture, but that's still a far cry from the wake of a canoe, which is definitely not spherical. But I realized if I break the problem in two and solve it individually on the CPU and separately on the GPU, it might work okay just in the case of canoeing, because boats are inherently more drifty, and even with the perfect sphere I was finding that I had to relax the collisions to make it feel more fair to the player. So for the visuals, I added another invisible particle trail behind you that's rendered to a texture on the GPU using a separate camera. This camera only renders this one special particle trail. With a little bit of math, you can detect where each pixel of this texture is in world space, and if the pixel is red, then it should be colored, otherwise it's uncolored. That gives a really nice effect, but there's a few issues here. Since I'm taking a 2D texture and applying it to a 3D world, it's very imprecise, so you can see here all this noisy artifacts on the girl in the canoe, and the problem here is that they're in the exact same position as the wake if you were to view the world as 2D from top down. Similarly, if you're in a cave for example, anything above the wake will be coloured because in top down 2D, again, it's the same pixel. I could limit this new particle trail system to only colouring the ocean and the fish, but then that leaves the girl, the dog, and the canoe all pretty lifeless. Colour represents her emotional state, so this doesn't really make a whole lot of sense. The second issue is that this is on the GPU, so it can't interact with anything in the world. Pulling this texture back onto the CPU and sampling it would just destroy performance, so that's really not an option. Worse still, the wake is behind you, so from a gameplay perspective, trying to interact with objects behind you would just be awful. So this is where I kept hitting a roadblock, and I couldn't really balance the visuals and the interactivity, but you guys kept leaving comments and I just kept thinking about this over and over, and then it hit me. There's a pretty straightforward solution to all this. Up until now, all the colouring is done at a global level. So for example, this rock knows about the same colour sources as this bush, and the girl, and the dog, and the blade of grass, and you get the idea. I never really considered that maybe that doesn't actually have to be the case. I realised I could still use a spherical colour shape in addition to the wake, but if I could only somehow limit it to the girl and the dog, if none of the objects in the world knew about this secret colour source, they wouldn't show it, and so the player would never notice that there's a sphere. 
So what I did is I hooked into the coloring pipeline where once all the global color sources have been sent to all the shaders, I can inject a set of secret color sources that are only for specific objects that get to know about them. I'm pretty happy with the solution, but I also feel kind of silly that it took so long to figure out. I guess when you've been doing something one way for almost two years now, sometimes you don't see the obvious ways you can do it differently. All your comments really kept me motivated to find a solution, so thank you for that. On the CPU side, these secret color sources act like any other, and it means that they can interact with the world. So even though it doesn't perfectly match the shape of the wake, you can still use it to interact with everything. You've probably also noticed that the ugly white circle indicators from the last devlog are gone. Instead, now there's a much subtler yellow flash at the tip of the paddle, and if you time your paddle strike properly, then you get this burst of color as the paddle comes down to the water. I think this looks and feels a lot better, but some of you mentioned that you don't like these kind of indicators, so I've added an option to disable it. And that applies not just for these, but all of the other visual indicators in the game, including the jump targeting, dock highlights, and the interaction markers. Turning this option off lets you play the game with no visual aids, leaving you to experiment and find things for yourself. I actually worked on a number of accessibility options this month, again based on your comments, including an option to disable the paddle timing requirement for players who have any kind of motor impairment or if you just want a more relaxed experience. With this option, all the paddle strokes are considered optimal and you'll get the max speed and color benefits without having to worry about timing. The most time consuming and complicated option was adding support for controller rebinding. I put this off for a really long time, but it's a pretty common request so I made sure to add it. The amount of effort involved in this was way more than you probably guess, and it required a ton of testing because there's so many edge cases. It's done now though, so you can have two buttons mapped per input on keyboard, defaulted to what I think makes sense for a left and right handed input scheme, and a separate control scheme just for your gamepad. I just want to say thanks to Samyam for this tutorial, which is a great starting point in figuring this all out with Unity's new input system. I'll leave a link to that down in the description. Finally, with canoeing feeling like a much more polished part of the game, thanks in large part to you guys, the game needs more room to explore. So the main islands are great, but I want to reward players who look around, so I added the first optional mini islands, which I'm calling Scaries. The Scaries will each have a single puzzle or interaction, which I won't spoil here, but when you solve it, the Scary will have its color restored. Think of the shrines from Breath of the Wild, but less intense, as Feral is definitely more on the casual side. I put up a poll on Discord, and it seems you guys overwhelmingly want the islands to be named, which I think will help players reference them and give a label when I eventually add a high-level map. So the Scaries are all going to be named after real-life Scaries from the Orkney Islands, where the game is based. And I have a fun idea for how to name the main islands that'll fit in really well and be a bit of an easter egg. I have to say I wasn't 100% sold on this one, but the poll is unanimous so I've added the title cards, and I think it does add a bit of cinematic flair when you land on the island. Alright, that's it for this one. Thanks again for all your feedback over the last year on YouTube and on Discord, and keep it coming on this video. I really love hearing from you guys. Oh, and wishless Feral North on Steam.